Welcome to our online worship service. Just a quick word before we begin. We are blessed to have a number of very artistic people at St. Hilda's Church. And so we've often used the arts to communicate the great truths and the great mysteries of our faith. We believe in the great Creator God. He is the ultimate artist. So each Sunday during Lent, all the way to Easter, and then afterwards to the day of Pentecost, we are going to follow the biblical narrative from Genesis to the book of Revelation. What you're seeing here is a photograph of a three-dimensional sculpture. It is meant to represent the land. And it is meant to be looked at as a kind of map. So we're going to use this as a backdrop for a journey. A journey from creation all the way to the new creation, God's forever kingdom. We welcome conversation and discussion. So to help on this journey, we have included a PDF with your email. Please take a look at it because it describes the way the artist tries to communicate the reality of God. Let me close by reading one line from the file. The images that you're going to see are meant to provoke our imagination and our reflections in trying to relate to the character of someone, God, we cannot see, but whom we know. Paul the Apostle wrote, we see through a glass darkly. So we thank you for joining us on this journey. So let's watch and listen. Looking back, a poem for Lent number one. From where I am kneeling, 
my hands in the hot, dry earth. Looking back across the gulf of soil between us, I ask myself, what have we done? I miss the shade, I miss the song of the river and the cool of the day. Most of all, I miss your voice, more even than the wind in the tops of the jungle canopy, passing on what you had in mind, what you imagined, unfolding it all over the sea. How you came up with the leopard's coat or the toucan flashing through the columns of light in Eden. From where we are kneeling, giving birth on the hot, dry earth, looking ahead from the gulf between us, we ask ourselves, what have we done? Welcome to our online service and the first Sunday in the season of Lent. Let's begin by praying together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. A second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. Praying together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith Turn to him. Have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And together we affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to God's Word. The reading is taken from Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. 
On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. This is the account of the creation of the heavens and the earth. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth, and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Instead, springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Story is probably one of the best ways to learn and remember. That's why Jesus used so many parables to teach. I have come to understand the Bible as one long story of God's saving purpose for humanity. I have spoken about this before, but I think it's worthy of a repeat. The Bible is a unified and progressively unfolding drama of God's action in history for the saving of the whole world. The Bible is not merely a jumble of history, poetry, lessons to guide your life, comforting promises, theology and commands. Instead, it is incredibly coherent. Every part of the Bible, each event, book, character, command, prophecy, and poem must be understood in the context of one long storyline. Now, many of us read the Bible as if it were merely a, a puzzle of little bits, you know, theological bits, moral bits, historical bits. But when we read the Bible in such a fragmented way, we ignore, I believe, God's intention to shape our lives through story. All of us live out of some story from our families, our, our past, our education, experiences, etc., which give shape to our lives. If we allow the Bible to be fragmented, as I just described, the real message of the Bible will be absorbed into whatever other story is shaping our culture, and it shapes our lives too. I personally believe that the dominant feature of the world and culture around us is basically what the Bible describes as idolatry. Namely, idolatry is the worship or the acknowledgement of other gods, things, rather than the one true God. Idolatry has twisted, I believe, the dominant cultural story of much of the Western world. People may be totally unaware and would be even shocked by hearing me say this, but the Bible is very clear that not acknowledging the one true God is to fall into idolatry. As you know, people will worship some thing or some one. Could be money or success or another person, but ultimately human beings do worship. If our lives are to be shaped by the Bible, we need to understand two important things. First, the biblical story is an amazing unity on which we can absolutely, totally depend. And two, each of us has a place within the story. And that's amazing. That's the way the Bible is supposed to work. And it's not like a, a reference or a, just a history book. 
you and I are actually part of the story. How so? The Bible highlights the centrality of mission within the overall story. And it begins in the very first chapter when God tells Adam, the first man, that he has certain things to do. He is to take care of God's creation. But unfortunately, by Genesis chapter 3, things go terribly wrong. And so the Bible narrates God's mission to restore his good creation. He does that by first calling Israel to embody God's creational purpose for the entire world. Remember the story of Abraham. You will be the father of many nations. In other words, Israel was called to be the light to the nations. And the Old Testament tells a story of Israel's response to their divine calling. They had a few successes and failures along the way for that task. Then Jesus comes onto the scene in the New Testament and in his mission takes upon himself Israel's missionary task. He perfectly embodies God's purpose for humanity. He is the light of the world and accomplishes the victory over sin and death, opening up the way to eternal life through his death and his resurrection. When his earthly ministry is over, he leaves the church with the same task to continue the mission. So, in our time, Standing as we are right now, between the giving of the Holy Spirit on that first Pentecost 2,000 years ago and the return of Jesus sometime in the future, our central task as God's people is to witness to the rule of Jesus Christ over all of life. We're part of the story. His story is our story. And so being fully soaked in his story, I believe, will protect us by the story of the culture around us, namely, the worship of other gods. And as I mentioned, the story of the Bible is incredibly unified, showing the progressive unfolding drama of God's action in history for the saving of the whole world. And I've just got to show you this before we move on. What is it, you ask? This is the work of a Lutheran pastor and another man who wanted to visually illustrate the interconnectedness of the Bible. The bar graph that runs along the bottom represents all of the chapters in the Bible. So here you will see the 50 chapters in the book of Genesis and so on. The length of each bar indicates the number of verses in the chapter. So here is Psalm 119, which is the longest chapter in the entire Bible. Now, each of the 64,000 cross-references found in the Bible is depicted by a single arc. The color corresponds to the distance between the two different references, creating a rainbow-like effect. So obviously the green lines represent the furthest line connection. And I found it very interesting that the lines between Genesis on the far left and the book of Revelation on the far right seem to be the longest lines. And in my opinion, it rightly illustrates the dirt the direction of scripture that says what God first created good in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 will one day be absolutely restored in the new creation that the book of Revelation speaks of. Really cool stuff. Let's pray before we look at the creation story. May the words of my mouth 
and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So we're going to look at the creation story today. The first five books of the Bible were basically written by Moses. And you've heard me say that we need to read the Bible in context, meaning what was going on? What was the political climate, etc., at the time the passage was written? When Genesis was written in the ancient Near East, there were other, quote, creation accounts of how the world came into existence. And these stories were common in places like Egypt, when Israel was captive there, and in the land of Canaan, when Israel came to take over that piece of land. It would have been all too easy for the people of God to adopt those stories of creation. For example, many of the gods worshipped by the Canaanites were closely associated with the fertility of the land. The newcomers to the land, the Israelites, would be obviously tempted to call out to those gods rather than to the Lord God. Moses writes the account that we find in Genesis. Historians and scholars can tell us that they know a lot about the various cultural stories that were circulating at that time. The Genesis account, however, is very, very different. And I'll give you an example. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. Then God said, Let lights appear in the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be signs to mark the seasons, days, and years. Let these lights in the sky shine down on the earth. And that's what happened. God made two great lights, the larger one to govern the day and the smaller light to govern the night. Now note the wording in the passage. What light would be the great light that governs the day? The sun, of course. And the smaller one at night? The moon. The creation account in Genesis chapter 1 deliberately avoids using the Hebrew words for sun and moon and uses this description instead. Why? Probably because the sun and the moon were so often worshipped as gods, that's idolatry, by the people among whom the Israelites were living. Those people had a, a sun god. They had a moon god. They had star gods. The Bible clearly describes the sun and the moon as created things, not gods. The attention, of course, all shifts to the one who creates everything, the Lord God. Reading the first two chapters of the Bible is like what we might happen to us if we go to the AGO, the Art Gallery of Ontario. And so you're there, you're standing in front of an amazing work of art. And then someone approaches you and says, how would you like to meet the artist who painted it? Genesis chapters 1 and 2 is an introduction to the great artist, the creator of everything. And not only that, even from the beginning of the Bible, we are introduced to the creator God who is deeply relational and personal. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, it says this, that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Kind of like a mother bird who's given birth and will care and raise her young. God is not far off. In Genesis chapter 2, we are told, Then the Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. And so you can imagine God stooping down, breathing life into the clay and dust. God is intimate, 
close to his creation. He has always been meant to be understood as personal. Later in the passage, we are told that God is in the habit of walking through the garden in the cool of the evening and meeting with Adam and Eve. As the Old Testament continues, we are told that God resides close by, in the tabernacle, in the tent of meeting, on the holy mountain. And when Jesus finally breaks onto the scene, he embodies the fullness of God in his very person. And then he breathes on his disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit, very reminiscent of the creative act in Genesis chapter 2, which I just described. And then we fast forward to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, we are told in the new creation, chapter, uh, chapter 21, verse 6, it says this, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there'll be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of those things are gone forever. But it even gets better. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, God creates humankind in his image, in his likeness. And note that the word image and likeness basically make the same point. Though God is the infinite creator and human beings are his finite creation, there is something fundamentally similar between them. Image is a metaphor. As we unpack it, we need to bear in mind that its function as a metaphor is to draw our attention to the striking similarity between human beings and God, while not for a moment denying that we are radically different from God. The likeness we have with God is clarified in verse 26. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish, the birds, the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Then God says to human beings, verse 28, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Not only is God cl close to us, he invites us to partner with him. He invites us into the story, to continue the story. God does this by expressing his perfect love by giving humans a task. In chapter 1, we're sort of bouncing around between chapter 1 and chapter 2, God gives Adam the task of taking care of his garden. One biblical scholar puts it this way, Just as powerful earthly kings, to show their claim of dominion, erect an image of themselves in the provinces of their empire, where they do not personally appear, so man is placed upon the earth in God's image as God's sovereign emblem. He is really only God's representative, summoned to maintain and enforce God's claim of dominion over the earth. The decisive thing about man's similarity to God, therefore, is his function in the non-human world. In God's kingdom, which he set up by creating it, the special role he has assigned to you and me is that we should serve as his, as it were, under kings, if you will, his vice regents, his stewards. We are to rule over creation so that God's reputation is enhanced. However, this passage has been abused over the years. And so, for in some circles, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, has become notorious 
because some people have misunderstood what the words to rule or even to subdue actually mean. And they've been used, they've used these words to legitimize a ruthless mastery over the natural world and over, sadly, human beings as well. It is very clear to me from Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that in God's own creative work, he acts, he creates for the good of what he has made, has made and not for his own selfish pleasure. And the key word there is good. It says that he, what he made was good. The earth, the sky, the sea, everything, everyone. He made it and it was very, very good. It is impossible to read this as suggesting that human beings are free to do what they like with God's workmanship. To be human means to have a huge freedom and the responsibility to respond to God and his good creation. So, God has made a place for people to live that is both beautiful and useful. There's food to eat, as well as postcard, as it were, beauty. One commentator says, beauty is part of God's creation. There are some things that are simply good because they are just absolutely beautiful. And as I look outside today, it is a beautiful blue sky, crisp and cold outside, beautiful. To make the same point, we jump ahead to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. God gives Adam the responsibility to take care of his creation, as I just explained. Rule implies lordship, but not exploitation. Man, as God's representative, must rule his subjects just the way that God does, for their own good, while legitimizing human use of the world's resources. But God gives no license for our abuse of his good creation. Unfortunately, that has happened all too often. The very earth, the land that we live in, has suffered the abuses of human beings not being good stewards of the earth, the land, and of course, when you look at human trafficking and slavery that's still happening today, we have abused our responsibility to properly take care of each other. And so, boundaries are needed. So look at verse 16. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you're sure to die. In God's garden, there is freedom. And the Bible tells us here, you may freely eat. In other words, they have the run of the place, except one thing. There's only one restriction. Do not touch the tree of life, which, by the way, tells us, the Bible tells us, is actually in the center of the garden. I think that's really important. Notice that the tree is in the center, not the man. And so it is when we try to become the center over against the Lord and his word, we are not to try to be God. Only God is God. Only God is at the very center. The tree of life in the center of the garden reminds us that there are moral boundaries which are given for our good and for our protection. And it's just the way things are. When we overstep those boundaries, there are consequences. The Bible tells us if you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. I like this comment that I read. Perhaps we need to write those verses clearly over the doors of some of our 
nuclear weapons installations or genetic research facilities. When human beings try to be God, we succumb to evil and the word of God's judgment is heard against us. There are consequences, as we all know. The interesting thing is that true freedom comes to you and me when there are restrictions. Think of it like this. When your pet goldfish is freed from its fishbowl, it does not survive very long in its newfound freedom. And of course, we've been there too. We abuse our freedom, you know, just this once. No one's going to find out. I can get away with it. Who's going to get hurt? It doesn't really matter. What will we do with our freedom? The prayer book says, great line, his service is perfect freedom. We are truly free when we live under God's gracious rule and do what he tells us. So in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, it clearly sets out what human beings are to do. They are to be good stewards of God's good creation. And you fast forward again to Jesus, who's given us a similar mandate to pattern, to partner, actually, with him, to take care of the people in his garden, so to speak. The nature of our relationship with God is expressed in not only what we believe about him, but how we look after his creation, how we look after each other. And we do this not merely as individuals, but as partners together. Next time we meet, I'm going to talk about what it means when it says that human beings are made in God's image as male and female. So please stay tuned for next week. Let's pray. Father, I bless you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made by our Creator God. We thank you, Lord, that you have chosen to reveal your glory to us, that you've chosen, Lord, to reveal yourself through words, even, in the scriptures. And Father, again, we, we pray that we would be a people who are deeply, deeply impacted by the story of the Bible. We are a people of the Word, of the Word made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so right now, Lord, I invite the Holy Spirit on my friends gathered. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Show us, Lord, the incredible grace of God in your creation, in the natural world, in each other. We bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue in prayer that this day and all our days may be full of praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That you'll keep us this day without sin. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That we may walk before you in paths of righteousness and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's take a moment and pray for the people that are in our lives. Father, we come before you in the very strong name of Jesus, confident in his grace and his creative power. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to encourage your people, made in the very image of God. Lord, what a mystery, what a, what a blessing that is. And so, Father, we want to pray for the people that are on our heart, especially those who are suffering at this time. We ask that the Spirit of God would stretch forth his hands of power, healing, restoration, hope on the people that we pray for today. And in our hearts, let's, let's name those precious people before the Lord. Lord, give encouragement this day. 
Help people to know, Lord, your incredible love for them, your mercy, your grace, your creative power. Let us commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and the protection of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And gathering our prayers, we pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And praying together, Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all of your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining us this Sunday. We pray that you would have a blessed week, a blessed, a blessed Lent.